processing. Uh, my name is Eugene Chepash, and I'm a developer on the GeoTrellis team at Azavia. Um, coincidentally, uh, GeoTrellis is a Scala library for doing distributed raster processing. Uh, but today I thought it would be fun to kind of step back and uh, reverse engineer uh, what we're doing just starting from the data. And uh, hopefully it'll be interesting and informative. All right. So it's a big data day, and I get a slide to vex philosophical about big data. And I'm going to take advantage of it. So a practical person would say, sure, I have a thread. I can put stuff in memory. Life is good. If I run out of memory, I can chunk it to disk, work on it in parts. And if I just can't wait for that, or I don't have enough disk or memory, I'll have to distribute it, and my life is hard. But if you're a more philosophical person, you would say, no, the reason we have big data is because we fundamentally don't know what we want. So we save everything that ho in hopes that later, at some point, we can write a program to traverse all the data and derive some useful information that we can actually comprehend as people. So just coming from that, whatever we're going to have as a tool for working with heaps and heaps of data, better be powerful as well as uh, composable. So hopefully we'll achieve that. But starting from the data. So the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, which is a UN body, released the fifth assessment report. And as part of that report, they released the outputs of 33 general circulation models. Uh, these outputs represent uh, temperature and precipitation at monthly intervals uh, for the next 100 years. And this is, uh, well, I guess this represents the consensus opinion for climate forecast. And uh, that's pretty cool. The NASA took the data set and uh, downsampled that for the continental US minus Alaska uh, at the same interval, adjusting it for local topology. And put it up on S3, which was very nice of them. Uh, now this data set is pretty interesting uh, because if we're going to forecast the future, we have to account for our own actions. Uh, how much uh, carbon we're going to continue emitting into the atmosphere. Are we going to taper off as the RCP45 uh, shows? Or maybe it'll take us a little longer to get there or we're we just going to burn everything, I guess. Um, so if we have uh, these possible futures, uh, we should be able to analyze them and compare them to each other and maybe use this uh, for planning or risk assessment. And in fact, Azavia has a grant uh, to do exactly this, to take this global climate change data and make it relevant uh, for city decision makers or local decision makers, uh, which is uh, very interesting. So I have a stack of rasters. Uh, the first thing that I really want to do with it is get some kind of time series out. Uh, I don't know what it's going to look like, but you know, stack of rasters through time, time series makes sense. So let's design an operation that uh, we want to make. So kind of the first requirement for this is uh, we're going to need to have some sort of consistent tile layout that's going to make it easy for us to work with these rasters. And it should be such that uh, the tile ID geospatially corresponds uh, to the same tile ID temporally in the next stack. So we're able to just uh, refer to them as integers and uh, not worry about the extents. Have that built into the tile layout system. We're going to need a tile manipulation library, and we're in luck there. GeoTrellis raster already has uh, lots of map algebra operations, uh, some hydrology operations, uh, do focal, zonal, you know, local operations, of course. So cool. And we need some way uh, to take these operations and distribute them across the data. And uh, we'll get to that later. All right. And uh, if we wanted to optimize this a little bit, we'd realize, yeah, so if our area of interest is just a polygon and it intersects only a subset of those styles, uh, it would be good if we didn't have to load anything else into memory. And that requires uh, some foreknowledge of our data, some uh, metadata about the layout, the extent, the resolution. And uh, we'll need some operation to maybe control the granulity of time. So if we have a monthly data set, that's a little noisy. We want to see it on annual scale. All right, and finally, once uh, we do that, we should be able to just take the zone and compose it down into array of dates and uh, temperatures. Temperatures and Kelvin notice because we are scientists. All right, so yeah, we can actually do this. Um, I've been told this is not a terribly impressive demo, so I'm just going to do it right in the middle and set it up for talking about what it actually does. But uh, here on uh, AWS, we have a Mesos cluster running with a bunch of workers. And uh, we have this data set. 
you know, somehow manipulate it. And we should be able to just uh, shoot a REST request against it and get some sort of time series. So here is a leaflet draw map that will give me a GeoJSON that I can shoot against the REST API. I want to see what the future holds for the golden land of San Francisco. Oh, right, yeah, cool. Uh, we got two time series here. The blue one is the RCP45, the lower one, and the orange one is the RCP45. And um, so if we look at it, I guess it doesn't tell us too much. Uh, we can see that if we emit more carbon, the temperatures go up, uh, which I guess we anticipated. Uh, but we got an output, and I guess what I'm trying to sell here is that uh, the fact that we got an output and uh, it tells us something that we expected that right here around the region of uh, 2030, they're pretty similar and then they diverge. Uh, let's see, maybe it looks a little bit different. Ah, this is horrible. What is going on with these resolutions? All right, so let's move it somewhere else, see if it looks a little different. Yeah, okay, uh, same kind of pattern remains. All right, so I'm not impressed with my little calculation that I came up with. Um, it got, got us a time series that kind of told us what we expected, but uh, that's progress. Uh, so what did we use to calculate this? Uh, we used Apache Spark. Uh, thankfully, I haven't talked about it a little bit before, but if I had to summarize it uh, for new people in the room, essentially, the selling point of Apache Top Park is the resilient distributed data set, which is this abstraction that represents a distributed collection across a number of workers. Uh, the master is able to assemble a data transformation pipeline and just ship it out to the cluster where uh, they transform uh, the collection and uh, maintain some history. So if a portion uh, of the cluster dies, it's able to rebuild it and save some time on that. Uh, the really interesting part about that is that this is a pretty rich API and it allows us uh, functional transformations on the collections, MapReduce being a basic uh, flat map filter combined by key. Yeah, so if uh, our collection is actually tuples of key and value, we can treat it as a key value collection. And that's uh, pretty close to what we want if we're talking uh, about uh, working with an uh, indexed set of tiles. So we've made a raster RDD of K. Uh, K is a type of key, can be just a spatial key, column row in the tile layout, or uh, could be a combination of that and a space time. And of course we have to carry the metadata with it forward so we can do our operations, uh, kind of pre-plan them on the master. All right, so this is the actual code to describe this calculation. Um, that wasn't very useful. But nevertheless, we can identify the stages uh, in it and kind of see how it forms a pipeline. Uh, so perhaps uh, somebody who actually is a climate scientist uh, can come and uh, make a useful calculation, perhaps using two layers, and come up with an insightful time series. All right, but uh, how did we even get to this uh, nicely tiled uh, data set? I mean, all we had is a bunch of NetCDFs on S3. And NetCDFs is an awesome format for uh, scientists, but it's not so great for us, because first of all, the files are pretty large, they're about a gig each and uh, we can't read them uh, in memory. We have to save them to disk, use GDAL to read them. Would be nice if we could have them as GeoTIFFs. GeoTIFFs, we can read in memory because uh, we wrote our own GeoTIFF reader uh, that just runs natively on JVM, and we can just read them as a byte stream. Uh, so that's a little uh, pre-processing. We uh, spin up an AWS autoscaling group that uses Rostereo to take the NetCDFs, chunk them out into GeoTIFFs, and put them back into S3. Uh, very nice. Now we're able uh, to pull down the GeoTIFFs and we come to a realization that, ah, maybe they're not on the projection that we want. Uh, we want to be able to reproject them. The second realization is, is that these tiles that they're in, uh, they really have no meaning. They're just wherever the pixel boundaries happen to fall. So look up the reprojection first. Uh, we can use Proj4j to reproject the raster tiles uh, directly on JVM again, which is pretty cool. But it completely messes up the tiles. It shrinks some, warps others, 
Uh, that's not a real projection, but it was pretty expedient to draw. So something like that happens, right? Uh, you had a grid, and now you just have a pretty mess. So really what you need to do is uh, start collecting metadata on this pretty mess. And we can use uh, Spark functional operators to do that. Uh, we can collect the extent and also the resolution and the type of the tile and sort of uh, merge them until we get the final uh, object that represents uh, our whole collection on the server. And this whole thing happens in memory uh, after it's been read from S3. And so I guess as an illustrative point, uh, we can look at the code and without reading it, we can identify the stages and see, yeah, okay, I, I can see what happens there. That's pretty expressive. Um, all right, so now we have the metadata on our layer. Uh, we have to pick a tile layout. If we're gonna pick any one, we might as well pick a useful one. So we're gonna pick something that maps uh, to a TMS service, uh, something that we can throw directly into Leaflet without merging tiles. And uh, that'd be awesome. How can we do that? Uh, each uh, zoom layer has an implied resolution, just because you know how big each tile is and uh, how wide uh, the zoom uh, is. So you can see that as you go down, essentially you get twice the width and twice the, uh, twice the what's the opposite of width? Height, sure. All right, and um, we uh, just pick the closest zoom level and say that's uh, gonna be what we're gonna be burning our layer into. And we don't have to do that, we can pick an arbitrary level, but uh, that's a pretty good default, I feel. So now we have a problem of mosaicing. Um, so at the most basic level, we have the grid that we know the tiles are going into, but uh, we don't know how to combine them. We sort of squint and say, oh yeah, that center uh, tile right over there um, overlaps, and we just need those three pieces. And that's not very useful because uh, we have to start from something we don't have. Uh, what we can do is um, intersect the extent of each particular tile with our grid that we've determined and decide uh, which of the tiles in the grid it's going to be contributing to. We get this kind of list. Uh, if we sort of invert it with a flat map, we get what looks like uh, a larger collection that's uh, keyed on uh, the destination tile. Uh, in fact, all of those are memory references because each individual tile had to be on a, one machine. And these are just basically new reference to the same object. And we can just go ahead and reduce down this list, uh, merging any tiles uh, that have the same key into the destination tile and just burning it piece by piece by overlapping the extents. Uh, you notice the time we actually carried through from uh, the GeoTIFF metadata and that's completely orthogonal to this process. Uh, it just uses here to provide identity, essentially. As long as the two spatial keys share the time, uh, they're gonna be burned together. If not, they're gonna be deferred for the different tile. So it's pretty nice to be able to define this just as a spatial operation, even though we're working with uh, spatial temporal tiles. All right, uh, we can apply the same process uh, to pyramid our tiles up, except now we intersect the extent of our tile with the extent of the grid one level up and we burn them down with combine by key. Uh, so we've used the same process twice and we've used uh, these uh, Spark functional operators uh, all the way through. I'm actually pretty happy. I'm feeling like this is the way to handle geospatial problems. So it's a pretty naive mosaic, uh, but it works. And uh, we can imagine uh, that we can augment it. Uh, the source tiles don't have to be from the same extent. They don't have to be from the same resolution. We sort of figure it out. In this case, of course, they are because we got them pre-processed from uh, NASA. So, all right. So we have to talk uh, about storage. We've got our tiles in memory. What can we actually do to store them? And uh, we have some choices. Uh, we can dump them into the HDFS. And HDFS is a distributed block store. And the really great thing about it is that its throughput is fantastic. Uh, we can just uh, dump a whole lot of data into it and be pretty certain we cannot do any faster. It has uh, this hierarchical structure uh, that uh, the name node sort of acts as a directory for the data nodes and it shuffles uh, the blocks of your records around to make sure that there is enough redundancy in them. And uh, in case one of the node failures, uh, you don't lose, well, you potentially don't lose all of your data as it'll be, be able to recopy it from another node. That's a nice guarantee. Uh, but the real downside is, is that we really have no information of uh, where those blogs reside. 
So what we need is uh, some kind of um, index into these blocks. Uh, something that allows us uh, to reason about the distribution so we can uh, optimize them. And uh, that's where we can use a cumulo. A cumulo is a columnar <coughs> big table clone database uh, that runs on top of HDFS. Essentially, it uses HDFS uh, to store the underlying blocks. And then the index uh, that it maintains is uh, sorted. Uh, the columnar part of it means is that we can uh, really shove a lot of information into one table and expect the table to get pretty wide. And it gives us new abilities to query the data. We can uh, give a range query and get, get a range of keys back. And we can filter that information before it gets materialized uh, in our Spark layer. So those are pretty important for performance. Uh, we can think about it. Um, oh yeah, so I guess the important thing to notice that the architecture of Accumulo mirrors the sort of general architecture of HDFS as well. Uh, it's just straight up augmentation the way I'm looking at it. The tablet servers provide the index view into the nodes. Uh, the master kind of organizes the index and uh, it occupies the same place as the Hadoop directory, the name node. Right. So this is a, a truthy view of the Accumulo table we can use. Um, and I guess the important thing to say here is that, like with all uh, columnar database, uh, Accumulo, HBase, Cassandra, uh, we have a guarantee that if the records share the same uh, row boundary, so as long as the row ID is the same, they will not be written to different machines. Uh, we can exploit that to line up our data sets. So if we're working on uh, two layers uh, from two different data sets, as long as they're in the same table and we query from the same table, we can be certain that they will be materialized on the same machines with the uh, corresponding row IDs, with, with corresponding grid locations uh, matching, allowing us to do really efficient uh, local operations. And uh, in general, uh, once you have an index into your data, you can start reasoning uh, more abstractly about it. Uh, you can talk about alignment, which is what I just mentioned. It's a neat trick that you can do. Uh, you can talk about whether this data is actually distributed evenly across the cluster. Uh, you can start reasoning about locality. So if I uh, bring up a chunk of uh, my index into memory, and I have you know, the first 10 records, how likely is it that the records in this index are spatially or temporally related. And as soon as you kind of ask, start asking these questions, you come into the concept of a space filling curve, uh, which essentially maps a multi-dimensional space into a single dimensional space. A uh, single dimensional space is really all we ever have for storing things, whether it's on a file system or in the database. So this comes up literally everywhere. Uh, GeoTrellis ran into it, uh, GeoMesa ran into this issue, GeoWave, Evan mentioned it. So what started really recently is this uh, collaboration between location tech projects uh, to take uh, the ideas of the space filling curve and sort of crystallize them, benchmark them, come up with strategies that would uh, be good for a particular use case, and come up with a JVM library for doing these uh, kind of uh, multidimensional queries. So I will direct you to that issue number three, which will go down in history <laughs> as the greatest uh, uh, GitHub issue ever, uh, with a lot of people participating. So if uh, you've kind of excited uh, about the idea of space filling curves up until this point, uh, please check it out and contribute to the conversation. All right. So yeah, we actually ran some benchmarks uh, on this cluster. And uh, this is kind of what we get. So they're not pretty, so you know they're real. <laughs> uh, so this is the operation that we've defined that sort of uh, selects the polygon and uh, reduces it down to annual resolution and uh, creates a time series out of that from just summing up uh, the polygon. Well, actually, we're doing the maximum on the polygon. I guess I should have mentioned that. Um, and we arranged the benchmarks for different uh, spatial extents. Uh, and uh, the story, I don't know, I guess if you squint, they kind of look linear. Um, I would exp oh yeah, the scale is in milliseconds. So we can get an answer for the whole United States in 400 milliseconds, which is like, 
Yeah, it's a fair amount of time. Uh, but that's only with two nodes. Uh, with eight nodes, we get it down in uh, just a little bit over a minute. Uh, so in theory, uh, if you keep the data sets uh, constant, size constants, and the data set size is uh, 75 gigabytes, uh, you should see this level out as you're just doing too much distribution and you're really not actually paralyzing anything. You're essentially turning memory communication to the network communication. I'm not sure if that's happening there at that point, uh, but it could be. Uh, this is uh, benchmarks of local operations. Uh, I don't know what happened there uh, with uh, two nodes for the US data set, uh, but after that it looks uh, pretty good. Uh, we can do a local operation frighteningly fast, so the data alignment works. Um, all right. So I guess uh, I'll take questions now. Can you show us the issue? Can I show you the issue? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I should. Oh, it's not even a link. I just colored it blue. <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> All right. So here we have uh, an excellent post uh, by Rob over there summarizing, you know, hey, you know, this is an issue. Uh, maybe we can use Z-index. Here are some formulas that make sense. And that's a pretty long post. Hey, Rob put a lot of effort into this. And then uh, there's an addendum by Rob. All right. Uh, you can see the scroll bar. <laughs> uh, here we have, uh, is this the PhD student, actually, that uh, came up with the concept of ARFs? Uh, kind of like a bloom filter for ranges. Really cool. All right. Yeah, response, Rob. Ah, right, Chris, benai. <laughs> Tom's the knowledge on us. <laughs> I've been told he is the index for the internet. This makes me believe. Um, then David Smiley has uh, something to say. Um, and that's pretty cool, actually. He has a lot of experience. And we're pretty excited. You can see, thanks for all the comments. <laughs> all right, I'm going to start using the scroll <laughs> space bar now. <laughs> we have pictures, too. <laughs> So S is actually, you know, the multidimensional space that you have, that long time kind of continuous series. Uh, you can partition it into chunks uh, using a partitioner function uh, that I guess gives you a hypercube uh, H that then you're able to transform the coordinates from the partitions into the index into the space filling curve. And you can go back, you can take the index from the space filling curve and get as far back as the extent in uh, H, or rather through H, but you can never go back uh, to the original S because essentially you lose the resolution as uh, you go uh, down. Uh, yeah, and there's math in this. <laughs> oh. So <laughs> anyway, you should read this issue and uh, you should contribute if you have ideas. Oh, please, question. Okay. I have a couple of questions on the use of Spark and something like GeoTrellis. Do you support multiple user access? And how do you get around the, the problem of Spark being a single context? So if one process or thread is accessing your distributed RDPs, everybody is locked out from mm -hmm. accessing that context. Uh, so there is a couple of ways that you can address that. We haven't uh, explored them um, really aside from thinking them yet. Uh, but you have the Spark job server, which will share uh, a Spark context uh, between, uh, essentially through a REST interface. And you're able to ship on a, a small jar that describes your operation. It'll uh, perform some operation on RDD, give it you back. That's one option. Yeah. Uh, another option you can do. You're still brokering multiple users against a single context. It's, it's not actually a, a, a file format or memory structure. That That's true. Uh, if you have, uh, so what you're talking about is uh, you have like intense users that really can't uh, share one context because you're afraid of blowing it away or causing a lock in it. Um, you can uh, use a uh, fine RDDs, scheduling. On RDDs in general, you, you pay a penalty to load and create the RDD. So what you're accessing here has already been persisted. 
interested in an RDD, but if your underlying data structure is changing, you need to rebuild and, and reload those RDDs, right? So what we're accessing here, we're actually materializing the RDD from uh, Accumula. So that's not very expensive. We can bring them up pretty fast. Um, I guess I'm not following your question about uh, changing the RDD. Um, underlying data is changing. So if you have to update the table, uh, it would have to go through the persistence layer because that's ultimately uh, how you disseminate the information. So in uh, this, this case, your data is not changing. It's a geotip. It's coming from that CDF that was created by... Yeah, the that's... It's fairly static. But in the context of if I have evolving data structures coming into a system, mm -hmm. and I need to update those into RDDs, I am actually preventing access to that system while I'm updating the RDDs. Is that correct? Uh, that's kind of correct. Uh, there are ways to get around it with various efficiencies. Uh, so what you're describing kind of sounds like a streaming situation. Um, not specifically, but just non-static data. Right? When updates happen, what is the performance penalty of the system for a collection of users that are expecting availability? So, okay, I guess uh, I can't give you a really specific answer. I can give you a general answer that hopefully will be useful. Uh, you can use uh, the facilities in Mesos uh, to sort of have multiple contexts running together. That's not very useful if uh, you can't share the, if you have to share the RDD, and then essentially you handle the sharing in the partitioning, uh, if, uh, or rather in the persistence layer. If you have to do it um, where you do share it in the persistence layer, I guess you can uh, use something like the Tachyon, which yeah. promises to deliver that. Yeah. I have not tried it myself, so I cannot uh, say anything other than that it promises to deliver that. Yeah. I've seen Tachyon over HDFS, I've seen Tachyon standalone, I've seen you know, Mesos deployed and stuff, I'm just still kind of trying to understand how, you know, you're getting great performance, but it's very static, persistent data. And, and that's exactly, yeah. The is already built, and so now we really fast things on it, but there's other issues related to how that will scale with real world. Um, I guess it depends uh, on what you're trying to do. Like, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly correct. Um, I think uh, in most of the use cases that we're considering, and I don't want to speak for other people, but I think it's a pretty common viewpoint, is uh, that you want to select your data from a large pool and apply some sort of transformations reasonably on the fly. It's not a real-time system. It's a hell of a lot better than you would get otherwise. And this use case, it covers really well. Uh, if you are trying to do a real-time system where you're just updating the system, uh, uh, updating the data in a distributed way, I think some of those use cases can be handled by uh, streaming, where you accumulate the information into RDD. I don't know that I can speak about that from experience. Yeah, so that would basically be <laughs> my answer, uh, hopefully. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so the size of the data set uh, is uh, 75 gigabytes uh, per one combination of uh, the s emission scenario, the model, and uh, whether it's a future or the past. Uh, how many tiles that ends up being? Uh, I'm not sure. I guess we can work the calculation back from, I know it ends up uh, being on the leaflet zoom level 8. And that covers the United States. Uh, so you can kind of backward the calculation from there. How big each tile is? Oh, yeah, the, each tile is uh, 512 by 512. Uh, we can play with the size uh, to sort of optimize, uh, I guess, the expected size of the query to sort of not fetch unnecessary information. About 512 or uh, 256 uh, seem to be standards for both transmitting it over the network and working with it uh, seems pre work pretty well as well. So here we're working explicitly with uh, raster data. Um, working with uh, vector data in conjunction with raster data is on the roadmap after the .10 release, which is uh, going to be in April. 
so that's an interesting set of questions. What does it actually mean to have a distributed set of vectors and tiles and how you combine them? Um, We've thought about it, we haven't coded it yet, uh, but there's a lot of collaboration that's coming up from uh, GeoMesa and GeoWave to answer that question, so I'm very confident it's gonna be tackled. All right, well thank you very much.